Desi Arnaz was born in Santiago de Cuba, but fled to Miami, Florida in 1934 due to the Sardin's Revolt, also known as the Cuban Revolution of 1933. When Arnaz arrived, he found refuge and comfort in the show business, playing a role in many minor films in the 40s, such as Father Takes a Wife and Too Many Girls. The latter film is where he met his first wife and lifelong friend, Lucille Ball. It was love at first sight, and not even a year later they eloped. In May of 1943, he was drafted into World War II. He successfully completed his recruit training, but shortly after injured his knee, limiting him to a military hospital. Arnaz was discharged as a staff sergeant, and he served from 1943 to 1945. After his time spent with the U.S. Army, he then starred in his first major role as Ricky Ricardo in I Love Lucy, with his wife Lucille playing the titular role. Initially, the role was to be portrayed by Richard Denning, who played Lucille's fictional spouse on the CBS radio sitcom My Favorite Husband, but the couple insisted on Desi playing the part. At first, CBS refuted the idea. Americans would not accept a distinctly Latino man playing the husband of a white woman. To combat the station, Lucille and Desi toured around America with their own vaudeville act in the summer of 1950. Much of this act was used to produce the pilot episode, and the rest was etched permanently into television history. From the first interracial couple on television, to the first mainstream TV pregnancy, I Love Lucy had many milestones along its sixth season run. It was the first American program aired on British television, as well as one of the most watched shows in America in four of its six seasons. One of their more notable milestones has to be the use of 35mm film in a multiple camera setup, which led to a much higher quality of television than before. Arnaz and his cinematographer Carl Freund have been credited with creating the multiple camera setup, but there had been multiple shows that had used the technique before then. However many milestones the show had, one of their biggest must be that I Love Lucy was the first television show to be filmed in front of a live studio audience. Despite being told it was impossible, Arnaz and Freund were the first to design a set that could accommodate a live studio audience, cameras, and film equipment while staying within the guidelines of the fire, health, and safety codes. This set design led to an entirely new era of live studio television, and gracefully merged theater and film. Desi Arnaz passed away on December 2, 1986, at age 69. Including a lifetime of laughs and music, Desi Arnaz's impact is not one to be forgotten. With two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and an award-winning TV show still being rerun more than half a century later, Desi Arnaz's legacy has set a precedent, one that communicates to young Latinos that through dedication and perseverance, anything is possible. I'm from Puerto Rico. Hi, my name is Erica Maria and I'm from Mexico. So, what is unique about your country and why? So, something that I've noticed when I went to visit Mexico around two or three years ago is that when we were driving through all the different states, there is always some sort of different um, kind of like accent. So, everyone always has their own slang, everyone always has their own like different accents and they will tell you oh you're definitely from this state so for example if I said hola yo me llamo Erika people would say oh yeah you're totally from Durango and like I'm like how do you know that you're a total stranger to me so I think that's pretty unique that people kind of can pinpoint where you're from based on how you speak and like the slang that you use um, that it's just beautiful and there's like a bunch of variety in it so like depending on where you go like, 
there's just different parts of it that's different. Like we have beaches, we have like beautiful towns, beautiful people, just everything like that. What's unique about your culture and why? So something that I find really unique that I don't seem to find um, in other um, cultural backgrounds with my friends is um, family is really united together. When it comes to uh, Mexican families and Mexican households, we always want to eat at the table. No matter what Mexican household I've been in, it's always, let's eat at the table, let's talk about our problems, let's cry together. So I feel like the country in itself just cries together and we always share food with each other, which kind of ties in with the always having dinner with each other. And I feel like that's pretty unique about the Mexican culture and the country in itself. I just think like Puerto Rican culture is just the best, like one of the best cultures because we have like good food, we have good dances, we have good music, just everything about it is good. <laughs> um, my favorite thing is like I just feel like it doesn't matter if you're family with the person but whenever people are at my house like they just get treated as family. And that's just how it goes. If you could describe Mexico in three words, what would those three words be and why? Um, so three words that I would choose for Mexico would be courageous um, because they've been through a lot of very long wars that I've read with my father for quite some time when I was younger. And then also they're very prideful as in people, even though they move to every other country, specifically here in the United States, we always keep Mexico in our blood, you know, we always say, you have it in your sangre. So, um, and then the last one would probably be impregnable. I feel like Mexico, no matter what happens, no matter what people say about the country, or even um, just overall threats that we've had, we've always been able to kind of go forward from it, and nothing's ever happened to us for quite a while. So, yeah, we're pretty indestructible. Um, vibrant, loud, tasty. What we're gonna have you do next is you're gonna draw the Mexican flag mm -hmm. in 20 seconds. Alrighty. <laughs> so what we're gonna have you do is we are going to have you draw the Puerto Rican flag in 10 seconds. Okay. Do you think you can do it? Yes. Yeah. Alright. Here are your markers. Here's your markers. Thank you. There's your whiteboard. Okay, and here's your whiteboard. Alright. Oh yeah. <laughs> Alright, ready? Set. Go. Go. Time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see what you got. <laughs> On it, you know. Yeah. 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 I, I, my parents hang like. They, we have like five flags in the house, and so I always <laughs> see it. No. <laughs> oh, you got it upside down. That's I all. got it upside down. No, you just hold it upside just down. Just put it upside down. Put it the other That's way. Right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we want to cut. That was perfect. Here's your whiteboard. Alright, ready, set, go. Diane Guerrero's parents were born in a small village in Colombia, as was Diane's older brother. In search of a better life, Diane's family moved to the United States and later had Diane in Passaic, New Jersey on July 21, 1986. Diane lived a calm life up until freshman year of high school. Diane called her family after school, but no one picked up the phone, which was odd to her. 
She ran the rest of the way home, only to find that her family was nowhere to be found. Her worst fear had been realized. Her family was taken away to be sent back to Colombia. A passage from her book described the ordeal. At 14, I'd been left on my own, literally. When the authorities made the choice to detain my parents, no one bothered to check that a young girl, a minor, a citizen of this country, would be left without a family, without a home, without a way to move forward. I'm fortunate that Amelia agreed to take me in temporarily, but no one in our government was aware that she'd done so. In the eyes of the ICE, it was as if I didn't exist. I'd been invisible to them. With little access or communication to her family, Diane still went on to seek out her dreams. You can see her starring in the hit Netflix show, Orange is the New Black, as well as a recurring character in Jane the Virgin. Not only is she an actress, but she is also an award-winning author. She has published two works, including In the Country We Love, My Family Divided, and My Family Divided, One Girl's Journey of Home, Loss, and Hope. At the age of 32, in the midst of an immigration crisis, she steps up and advocates for the children being separated from their parents and families at the border dividing southern United States and Latin America. She continually advocates for immigration reform as well as speaking out about the long-term effects of what separation from families may do to these children. Diane Guerrero is a strong female activist that allows herself to be vulnerable and shares her story so that she may never see it happen to another child ever again. This month, we celebrate Diane for her activism, bravery, and pride for being a Latin American in this day and age. We celebrate her for speaking up for the hundreds of young immigrant children that still haven't been reunited with their families as of September 20th, 2018. She is the Latin American leader of our generation, and may she always be honored for her work, not only as an actress, but as a proud Colombian American who fights for immigration reform and better treatment of immigrants in this country. Bueno, que ha cambiado mucho porque me enseñó a trabajar en este país, me enseñó a valorar que aquí nada te regala, todo es a base de trabajo, donde tú vayas a vivir tienes que pagar tu renta, tu luz, tu teléfono y piles de gas. Eso es una parte bien importante que a veces nosotros como hijos, cuando somos menores de edad o tenemos la edad de 17, 18 años, somos bien variables, nos quejamos de todo que... Pensamos que nosotros merecemos todo cuando no hemos trabajado para merecer nada. Entonces eh, yo creo que es una parte a veces de la parte de la adolescencia que yo pasé por ahí y cuando llegué aquí pues prácticamente tuve que trabajar y supe lo que es ganarse un peso y un dólar. Cada minuto, ¿eh? desde levantarte temprano en la mañana, preparar tu comida, agarrar el autobús bajo cero, la nieve, híjole es difícil. Bueno, primeramente yo vine a Chicago engañado. <risa> engañado, no, mira, yo acabo de terminar mi, mi, mi preparatoria, mi bachillerato. Iba a empezar el primer año de universidad. 
Y un amigo me dijo, oye, vamos a Chicago, mira, este, allá y se han ganado mucho dinero, tú juegas bien fútbol, te consiguen un buen trabajo y vas a ganar el dinero del mundo. En ese aspecto, en el, yo decía, wow, pues a lo mejor sí es cierto. Veía las películas y decía, no, sí. How do you feel about Chicago being sanctuary? I think it's a joke. Why? Because you see, you see all the publicity about being sanctuary, whatever it's called, and then you see the mayor having meetings with the president talking about reforms and policies that the Chicago Police Department is now working with, um, with ICE, which is which, which they have because they're sending more ICE veterans over there. ¿Por qué me gusta? Mm -hmm. Porque es una ciudad buena, una ciudad prospera. Hay muchas cosas buenas para los estudiantes. Si saben aprovecharlo, saldrían adelante fácilmente. Porque hay muchas becas en las escuelas, hay muchas ayudas en los parques, hay muchas cosas para la gente que le gusta el deporte. Y entonces en otros lugares no creo que haya las mismas oportunidades que en esta ciudad de Chicago, Illinois. ¿Dónde naciste? Durango, México. Okay. Um, ¿Haces suficiente dinero para vivir una vida confortable? Dependiendo. ¿Qué Dependiendo en dónde trabajo, los estudios que haga dinero y las oportunidades que yo pueda obtener en la vida. ¿Actualmente crees que es suficiente para vivir una vida confortable? No. ¿Por qué? Porque hay muchos impuestos altos y nuestros uh, salarios no son muy altos donde nosotros trabajamos. ¿Ha cambiado tu vida desde que te metes a las casas nuevas? Sí, bastante. En nuestro país desgraciadamente es un poco más difícil que para encontrar trabajo para sobrevivir, mucho más difícil allá que aquí. ¿Cómo, cómo sientes sobre escuchar las noticias que van a hacer a la ciudad de Chicago una ciudad santuaria? Es bueno para todos los trabajadores como nosotros que somos latinos, que venimos de otros países, aprovechar las oportunidades que nos da esta ciudad, de que sea un santuario, un sentido más protegido, van a salir más adelante, sale más Ah, no lo siento tanto así, pero probablemente a veces algunos han sido discriminados. Muchas veces se ha visto en las noticias que mucha gente ha sido discriminada por su color de raza, pero yo hasta ahorita, gracias a Dios, no he sido discriminado. No me siento así discriminado. ¿Ves un gran cambio de diferencia en la cultura de tu país a la cultura de los Estados Unidos? Sí, por, por, sobre todo por lo que les viene diciendo. En nuestro país es un poco más difícil sobrevivir y tener las oportunidades que se pueden tener en este país. Well, the vision of the restaurant is to open up different concepts to our communities where they need it the most. So we realized in the inner cities of Chicago that there's a shortage of healthier concepts, so we decided to open up a healthier concept in this community of West Humble Park. The connection to food and culture is the thought process of when you eat better, you do better, meaning that if you're eating healthier foods, then you may think different and make better decisions. So it can impact the culture and the environment that you live in.
What dish are you making for us today? Some country pork ribs. Um, it's a South Carolina dish. Um, you actually just wash your country pork ribs off in the sink. After you wash them off, you get you some seasoning, garlic powder, onion powder, seasoning salt. Everything is done cooking. I have my little sauce made up and I dip them in the sauce and maybe put them back on the grill. Sometime I might put them in here, put this back on the grill and simmer. Yeah, I learned from my father. When I was a little younger, he used to, used to teach me how to cook, so I just used to watch him and learn from him how he was cooking. My name is Musa Yala, and I work at La Parma, which is a Puerto Rican restaurant, a Bolico restaurant. We also have a mixture of culture in our store. Here, a lot of people look forward to a lot of veggie, a lot of the carne guisa, the soup. A lot of people walk in here for a lot of things they look forward to that they don't get in their hometown in Puerto Rico. It's nothing going to be the same. Um, everybody got different ways of cooking. Here, we do a lot that we don't do in our hometown. Here, we get a variety. We don't get that in our hometown in Puerto Rico. It's not how it's made differently, it's how the people make it. Everybody got different ways of making it, different seasoning. Puerto Rico, we use a lot of homegrown. Everything comes like fresh from the ground. All that grows. And we, you know, we live off of that in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rican food is awesome. I love my rice with pigeon peas and uh, pork on the side. Uh, you gotta have your sweet plantains. Awesome with sweet plantains. Uh, Dumplings are also well, uh, known as alcapurias. Um, come visit the Palma whenever you guys get a chance. Awesome food here, awesome environment, and uh, love the employees, especially the lady, uh, the lady that was on here earlier. She's really famous. Basically, because it reminds me of my, um, normally that's how we were raised. We were raised on making these traditional dishes just to remind us about, I guess, who we are, where we come from. So that's normally why. I mean, it's like a routine. And we make it every day. It's either yellow or white. We use, normally I think the popular one is Goya. This is what they use, the Goya adobo. I use this one because it's less salt. This is the third part of preparing the Ibaritos. Now we're down to smashing them and refining them again into their golden brown. Puerto Rican. 